John Tennant has many, 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 many activists in Open Science Front, including our today's guest, said. Open science is just science done right. So naturally, science as a global common needs to be open, transparent and fair. And this is the continuous battle which started in the 90s with open access initiatives. Open access means that the results of scientific research are available free of cost and without paywalls. In addition, these results are not under strict copyrights, which permits open reuse, distribution and modification of the scientific literature. Numerous open access initiatives, declarations, manifesto and statements were proclaimed locally, internationally, in different organizations and countries, on the web, on the Twitter. Some of them failed, some succeeded. But the battle for open science continues even now during COVID-19 pandemics. Because only science, which is done right, can help us to find not only the cure to the infectious diseases, but to other global problems. My name is Stefania, and you're watching Open Science TV. This is the first part of four of our interview with German scientist and professor Jörn Brems. So, hi Bern, nice to see you today. Uh, you know yourself better, so please tell us about your work, your research, your project and your interests. Hello, my name is Björn Brems. I'm a neurobiologist and I work at the University of Regensburg in Bavaria. Um, I study spontaneous behavior and the consequences of it. And uh, that means essentially when uh, mostly animals, we study animals and mostly invertebrate animals like snails and flies, and they do things in certain situations to find out what to do next. So snails, for instance, they try to uh, look for food and they look around and spontaneously bite for food when there isn't anyone around, any food around when they're hungry or flies when we put them in a situation that's uh, very empty. They, for instance, probably look for an escape. Uh, and we use that behavior that of these animals to then make consequences, some consequences contingent on this behavior. So um, the snails may find food or the flies may get punished for flying into certain directions. And then we study both how they generate spontaneous actions and then how they learn about the consequences what these actions have. So it's a little bit trial and error and we study both the trial and the error uh, learning component. And for that, that has most of these experiments are all computerized and controlled by a software that records the data. And then we write programs to analyze and visualize the results of these experiments. And that has been the case since I started, since 1994, when I started doing these experiments. It's already been all digital. Uh, and so since then, essentially, I've been waiting for universities uh, in the various places where I've worked to provide some infrastructure for the data that we collect, for the hard, for the code that we write. But in those 26 years, nothing really has happened. Um, and in parallel, around 2006 or seven or something like that, um, I also heard, realized uh, and learned from other people online um, that journals are not some kind of given monolith that just exists and one has to work around, but they're actually you know, run by certain companies that have certain goals. And uh, I realized that the, um, the reform efforts that were underway back then, which was the open access movement, uh, that the reform efforts are actually just one small part of a very dysfunctional digital infrastructure that in many cases, if it existed, didn't work as it should, and in many places didn't even exist at all, such as for data and for code. And uh, so ever since, I've been trying, or I've been, so around 2006-7, as I said, 
um, I changed from waiting for someone to provide me with the infrastructure that I need uh, to try and tell people, hey, this is what we need, this is what we should have. And um, I've been writing about this. Uh, I'm now also a member of the library committee to influence our own institution um, to change our and to upgrade our digital infrastructure. I'm a member of a working group in the German uh, initiative of the for, for digital infrastructure of, of the Alliance of Research Organizations in Germany. So I have various uh, outlets uh, where I'm trying to articulate the kind of uh, demands that science has so that the people who are infrastructure experts can tailor the infrastructure appropriately to our needs. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have a very big CV of different research and open science activities. And coming back to your research interests, so as far as understood, you work in the field of neurogenetics. Um, it seems that the uh, world, uh, uh, sorry, it seems that the word uh, neurogenetics uh, stands for neuro, brain, and genetics, genes. What is the link between uh, brain and behavior and genes or DNA. Yes, so mostly here now we work in flies uh, at this time point in time and we use flies because we use genetic tools to manipulate the neurons. So we can man manipulate certain genes in the neurons or we can manipulate, uh, we can put new genes into certain neurons to switch them on or to switch them off uh, to uh, add or remove connectivity between neurons to increase or decrease activity, these sorts of things. And then the hope always is that so we have hypotheses of which neurons may be involved and then we manipulate them in some way, either we activate them or inactivate them or something like that. And then uh, if that has an effect on the behavior we're interested in, then we assume that these neurons must be important. And conversely, if these manipulations have no effect, which also happens, uh, of course, and uh, not all hypotheses are correct, in fact, most of them are wrong, um, then they have nothing uh, to do with what, um, uh, with what we're studying. And so that's where the genetic aspect comes in. It's mainly a tool to study neurobiology, and that's why I call it neurogenetics. Okay, I see. It's truly exciting to learn that uh, there is a certain uh, correlation between behavior and genetic information that can actually be edited and therefore have consequences on the way uh, the living organism behaves. And this is actually a bit scary. So let's pass to your open science activity. Uh, the definition of open science has a big variety of different interpretations and according to the paper of uh, Fetcher and Frisicke, uh, there are five school of thoughts in open science. Democratic, pragmatic, infrastructure, public and measurement. But what is open science for you personally? Now, open science to me means that we're not hiding anything. We make everything open from the beginning. So we're not hiding what kind of hypotheses we use. We're not hiding uh, what kind of results we get. We're not hiding what software we use. We're not hiding what hardware we use. Um, everything that we do is as open as it's currently possible. And ideally, it would be automatic. Ideally, we would just do our experiments, collect our data, analyze them, and the open part, meaning that everybody can see it, would be automatic by the infrastructure that we use. Because if we save it somewhere, if we save our data somewhere, it can be automatically published. This is, just has to be implemented. Same is true for our code, and then the connectivity between code and data, all, everything like that, uh, ideally, uh, should not cost me any time or effort. It should be automatic. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. It's nice to hear this kind of speeches from scientists that want to reform science. And for the moment, open science is a very trendy subject, and at least in academic world. From your point of view, why is current academia is in need of open science principles? And how a research process following open science practices uh, the process which is transparent, open, reproducible and fair, how it can deal with 
current sanitary crisis uh, or other crises which will certainly appear uh, in the very near future. So why do we need open science in the research? The main reason for why we need open science, and I'll, I'll, I'll add a little caveat in a second. Uh, the main reason is such that we can scrutinize and check each other's process as it happens. Uh, that speed is not necessarily important unless you have something like a pandemic. Um, speed helps because in general it's public money and so the public deserves uh, the most efficient use of that money and that usually includes speed. Uh, not necessarily because not at the cost of speed shouldn't come at the cost of, of quality and of reliability. So if something comes quickly but isn't an, is worthless then it's not an efficient use of public money. Uh, so there has to be some use to it. Um, now, what I think is helpful, but not strictly necessary, is to have this to be all to have this all this whole process also be open to the public. This is a good thing because the public pays it, and there are of course individuals in the public that are experts in whatever section it is um, that they're interested in, and that that may be open. And so, I don't see any particular danger. Uh, or you know, other than you know, generic dangers, but any specific danger that comes with making, with defining open as in completely open to everybody. Now, um, this, as I said, this is useful, but I don't think I would put the word necessary there. I think it would already help a lot if the research process would just be open to other researchers. And then, but then, for one, you run into the problem: how do you define what is a researcher that should have access to this and then you run into other you know technical and, and and other problems in trying to how do you prevent other people from going to it and why would you put up extra work to prevent people from accessing it right so that's a different open science with open for the scientific community is definitely necessary whereas open science uh, open to the community to everybody not just the scientific community but the whole world uh, is beneficial, um, so I would definitely say, of course, given the problems in locking out the public, uh, why not do it? But I wouldn't say it's necessary. But in the same time, certain information and data can be either confidential or used by third people to generate, a, I don't know, the biological weapon, for example, so openness, in yeah. many cases, so it, 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 one has to be very careful, especially in biomedical and psychological science, when you're working with patients uh, or when you work with at-risk groups um, that are not necessarily patients. Uh, sociological research, there's many uh, situations where you just can't make things open, but you can yeah. provide infrastructure that you can still share the data, right? It doesn't mean open sharing, but if you have sufficient infrastructure, you can have high security facilities where you're only allowed, where you're strip search, where you're only allowed to go in, uh, you know, with your clothes on, but you can go and you can work on the data, right? And, you know, yeah. this is, you know, if you have the infrastructure, you can do this, but if you close everything down, you cannot even do that. But this is not open, but you have yeah, data sharing level. possible when you have good infrastructure, you can do that. And so that's why the openness is a tool and it needs to be used correctly. So this is the end of the first part of our interview with Bern Brems. Do not miss other parts about scandalous commercial publishers, about infernal ways of scientific publishing process and about overhyped prestige. Support our project by subscribing to our channel, by giving likes and shares, subscribe to our social media. Thank you. Bye. See you soon.